And please pray with me. Gracious God, I ask you to bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds that your Son, Jesus, our risen Savior, would be glorified among us this day. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Nice, you've learned the proper response. So now I have a question for you. How do you think the first people who heard these three little words responded? You know, the very first, those 11 apostles that were sitting there in the upper room. The women had gone to the tomb and they discovered it was empty. And then the two angels told the women that he has been raised and they discovered it and they were so excited and they ran, that's how I picture it, they ran to the door where the, uh, the apostles were sitting. They knocked on the door and then they said, He is risen! He is risen indeed! You think that's how they responded? <laughs> wah, wah. No, that is not how they responded. We know how they responded because it's recorded for us by the gospel writer Luke. I am going to re read their responses for, uh, for you. It says, But these words seemed to them as an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Why I decided to read that with an English, a very, very bad English accent, I, I just... It feels to me that the translator kind of misses the actual response. Remember, these are fishermen, right? These aren't scholars, these are fishermen. They would have responded in a different way. In fact, I need you to use your imagination, right? Because the word, the original word, is the word leros. And it's where we get the word delirious. It means crazy. It means just not it just it doesn't work they were just no this can't be so these were fishermen and fishermen tend to speak with a, oh I don't know a little saltiness so I think probably a better way to translate that word leros I, I'm not even going to say the word I'm just going to suggest to you that it's the stuff that farmers like to put on the field in order to make it grow. You know, the stuff that's produ produced by the male bovine types. Yes, it's true. Pastor Tim is suggesting that the very first response to those three little words, he has risen, is actually bull manure. <laughs> I'm just saying. But I don't blame them. I really don't. I mean, these words are earth-shaking. These words turn our world upside down. These words are scary news before they're good news. So, this week I was doing some research trying to figure out what was I, I was going to say uh, this Sunday morning. And I, I was reading and I was pointed to a YouTube where some professors at Luther Seminary, uh, some folks that I studied with, produced this video. It, it was a few years ago and the video was too long to show for you, but it was this great video and it talks about Easter and how now that Easter has come, Death no longer has the last word. That's, that was the, the major theme of this video. And I watched the video and it was very inspiring and, and I, I was filled with joy and then I made one of the hugest mistakes. I looked down at the comments. Can I get an amen? Right? Like, don't go there, right? Looking at YouTube comments makes you want to take a bath, right? You just feel dirty, right? I mean, there were some great, great responses, very encouraging, and people were, were, were overjoyed by what they said. But then there were some people that just needed to be those types of people. You know what I'm talking about. I came across one of them that said this way, that, that said this. I don't know how I ended up here, but I'd like to point something out. 
Death will always have the last word. Once you are dead, you cease to be. Your personality and character is gone. You have become a corpse. Everything you've remembered and everything you thought is gone. It's the cold, hard truth. Wah, wah. I remember reading this and actually being taken in because this person spoke as though they had this authority. As, they, they, as though they knew the truth and they just needed to let everybody on YouTube know. And then I realized that this person does not have authority. That in fact this debate has been going on for thousands of years. That, that some people believe and some people don't. And it's never been one of those things where you can fully, with words, completely convince people one way or the other. In fact, as we know by reading the New Testament, it takes faith. Don't get me wrong. I am absolutely, I, I've, I've read the evidence. And in fact, there is more evidence that points to the truth that the resurrection happened than not. Yes, Pastor Tim is also saying this morning that it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. And it's true. And yet I understand why it is that this woman and, this woman and so many other people need, need to say what they say. It's because of the human condition. As human beings, we have an incredibly difficult time living in the gray area. We need either black or white. Mystery is hard. We want to solve it. Doubt is not a good feeling. Living with faith is sometimes feeling like you, you, you grasp it, but then it slips out of your hands. I love the story of the preacher who every, every time she got up to preach, she would pray for the Holy Spirit to fill her. And then one, one, one person came up and, and asked, why do you pray for the Holy Spirit to fill you all the time? Why can't you just pray once and then be filled? And she said, the problem is I leak. <laughs> That's the human condition. It just is. And so it's hard to, to hold on, to, to grasp. And another problem with this is that it is the good news. It's the great good news. It's almost too good to be true. Think about these disciples. Think about what they had gone through. They loved Jesus. They spent day after day with him and then they saw him die on the cross. It was too much to think of the possibility that they could get him back, that they could be with him again. They wanted to just grieve. They were in so much pain that they wanted to just grieve and get through it and move on and begin to heal. You don't tell somebody who's dying of a terminal illness that there just might be a miracle. You don't tell a child whose parent has abandoned her that they're coming back unless it's true. Because otherwise it would just be cruel. Have you been there in that place before? Have you been in that place when you were afraid to dare to hope? When you were allowed to explore your, your deepest desire, your deepest longing, that place of grief? You know, we don't go to that place very often. We run away from that place 
because vulnerability is difficult because allowing ourselves to be open to something new, even if it's good, is hard. And so what we do is we avoid, we deny. Why do you think our culture is so absolutely sick with busyness? Why do you think we run from one thing to the next even though we're always exhausted? Why do we need to fill our schedule with one thing after another after another? Is it so that we can complain about how busy we are? No. It's because we're avoiding stopping and thinking and opening ourselves up to a deeper truth that will shape us and form us and change us and give us peace. And so I say to you this morning, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for not being too busy. Thank you for coming and allowing yourself to hear this beautiful good news, truth of Jesus Christ. It will change you. It will turn you upside down. It will affect you. We, we talk about it every Sunday here in this place. And the reason we do it is because it reminds us of what is real of what is beautiful, of what is good, of what is true. And we need to hold on to that so that we don't lose ourselves, so that we can learn to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, love our neighbor as ourselves, so that we can become fully alive. It's this big, beautiful, amazing story that can be summed up in three Simple words. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.